Uh, thanks so much um, for that introduction. Um, really stoked to be here. Um, some amazing minds here and amazing entrepreneurs, so I feel honored to, to be here presenting with you guys. And like a lot of people here, we're hiring, but I'm not going to say anything um, about that right now. Um, so I can't uh, see this one sec. Wrong way. Sorry, my bad. So how do I get here? Um, I lived in a refugee camp until I was three years old. Um, and my parents immigrated here in 1979. And like you heard, um, my dad came with a couple hundred bucks in his pocket and started selling used cars. My mom was a pharmacist. Fast forward 20 years, and we have a bunch of dealerships and pharmacies. I want nothing to do with the business. I blaze my own trail, go to UBC, and then finish uh, human biology and some computer science at U of T. This is during the early 2000s. I'm a little dating myself here, but that was when pet stores were getting multi-million dollar valuations online. Um, and I work for a company that raises 50 million US dollars. I was the about 25th employee. Uh, two years later, they sell their patents to RIM, uh, and they're sold for tax losses. Uh, at that point, no one wanted to program. I get out of the business, beg my dad to get into the car business. He says, no, go back to school. I do that with my wife, who's in the crowd. Thank you, honey. Um, <laughs> we all need a support. We all need a support infrastructure. Uh, I go back, and I fall in love with the car business. But I know it's broken. And then something magical happens. Steve Jobs announces the iPhone, and then the App Store. And I think, ha, epiphany. Nobody trusts a car salesman, right? Can I hear an all right here? Nobody, right? Yeah. OK, I was a car salesman. No one trusted me. Um, but I thought if I could bring transparency to one part of that business, and that was the trade-in part, where you bring your vehicle f for a new vehicle, I could solve some of the problems. So what we do is we launch uh, auctions in real time off the app to, an, to a market. Uh, we have thousands of uh, buyers and sellers across the country. Uh, and that started in 2009, and now we've moved over a billion dollars through the system in three different countries. So you go, OK, why are you here? Well, I want to hopefully share with you my mistakes uh, and how, through analogy, and how raising a startup is really like raising a child. And when you start a company, you think it's the cutest, smartest, awesomest company in the world, and you're going to do amazing things, but nobody else thinks that. Um, so first thing you have to do is you have to you have to make that baby. This is a challenge for a lot of people. Um, you got to find the right partner. And this is probably the single most important step of the process. Uh, you got to find someone that's not exactly like you, um, but complements you. Someone you get along with, someone you trust, and someone that's going to have your back. Um, uh, and I, uh, I did exactly that. I uh, went back to my programming days, had a guy that was a lot smarter than me, so he complimented me well. Um, loved to program, and I trusted him. His name was Wade. He's our CTO still to this day. Um, I hadn't seen him in years, and he just said, OK, let's do it. Didn't quit his job, but started working. As programmers, some of you might know, we're not the most artistic um, beings, and we really sucked at design. So what we said was, hey, I really, we really need someone creative. So I had a great friend of mine who was a great designer. He's in the crowd. Jay? Jay? Clap for Jay. There you go. <laughs> and so we have a company. We're the three amigos now. And uh, we're really excited to, to get this product going. We had some money, and we, we wanted to risk all of it, uh, basically, to uh, have an office and start our process. This whole concept took us about 9 to 12 months to put together. And that first part is really where we get into the infancy stage of a startup, where um, you have to release an MVP. You have to set that child out into the real world. And uh, we started doing this in 2010. But at this point, we realized uh, we don't have any salespeople. Um, we don't have any operations people. And so uh, again, we go through our network. I find someone to be my head of sales. 
uh, another couple of friends to help us with ops, and we get our first customer. We are so stoked. Um, but when you send your kid to kindergarten, he gets sick. Um, and we start signing up lots of people, and we start getting really sick. Um, we don't have a billing system. We forgot to build it. Um, so we huddle together. One week goes by, and that code is still running to this day, collecting money. So we're grateful for that huddle. Crisis one averted. We start selling. We start selling lots, uh, going door to door. And then people are asking us, this is awesome. We love this. But can you uh, put it on my BlackBerry? And we go, what? Um, no, no, BlackBerry's not going to be around much longer. Uh, you, need to get an you need to get an Apple phone. Um, and they're like, well, we don't want to get Apple phones. Well, we bought 100 Apple phones, and we started giving them out to people. At this stage, um, you're not worried if your kid's got a lot of social skills. You're just really worried if he's got motor skills. Can he walk? Can he talk? And that's all we're caring about, really iterating pivoting, and trying to move that company forward. The translation to grade school really happens through volume. You need to get user base. You need to mature. So we have to move. We're growing in people. Volume's going. A couple hundred cars um, a month, no longer. We're doubling quarter over quarter. We're in multiple cities. Um, and we, in this part of your life, you're really starting to learn what you like, what you don't like. Um, start developing some bad habits, maybe. Um, you start coming home and saying things your parents don't like. Um, but we have this great new vision, TradeRef 2.0. A brand new app, new UI. First time we're releasing an Android app. And we launch. And something really awesome happens. We crash. Uh, we, we come down real hard. And honestly, I had convinced people to join this company, and they are now quitting saying, what have you done to me? Why are we here? This company is going down the tubes. So we set up a war room. Luckily, we were in the cloud by this point. Uh, and we have one guy that's just restarting servers and another people looking at the stack traces. Uh, it took us about 8 to 12 hours, found the line of code that one of the really bad programmers wrote. Uh, and that's kind of what happens when you run fast. You break stuff. Um, we required a lot of tech debt, and we hired a lot of bad people. I mean, like crazy people. Like people we had to evict out of the office because they were squatting in the office. Um, but now we have three departments, a dev team, a support team, and a sales team. No HR just yet. Sales are really starting to grow. This is the fun part, the awkward years. Um, 2012, we land our first angel investment. Get a million dollars uh, from a customer that just loved our product. And in high school, though, you have a little bit of money, but a million dollars is not a lot if you start spending. And you really have to focus who you hang out with, how much partying you do, what university you're going to go to. You have to be really focused. While we start building a design team, you get a QA team, finally. Devs are no longer just QAing. We have a PM. But it starts causing stress within the organization. And the first time, we have clones, copycat products trying to imitate what we're doing. I mean, that's good, right? You've proven your business model. But really, you got to work now. So we double down again on technology. And we keep iterating on our product. But we're trying to stay focused. We have people coming to us and saying, hey, we love your technology. We think it would be great in the fish market or in the housing market, we stay focused. This would be the last year we would have a Christmas party at my house. Um, and finally, university. So companies ultimately have to make money or get somebody to give them lots of money. Um, and that's what we did. In 2014, uh, Car Auction Service is a public company out of the US, paid 30 million US dollars for half our company. Um, this was an awesome time for us. Um, but at the same time, you've got to be careful who you pick as your partner. Do you go private money? Do you go public money? Do you just keep going and try to do it on your own and not dilute? Lots of questions, lots of more competition. And again, we're doubling down on technology, and we're ready to release TradeRef 
five months after we get our funding, I get an email from Apple. We've revoked your provisioning profile. Your iOS app is done, <laughs> basically. A uh, little bit of panic. 70% of our users were on iOS devices, because remember, we gave out iPhones. Um, we bought $50,000 worth of tablets, gave them out to everybody, and we, I get a Skunk Works team to develop the responsive app for iOS. Two weeks later, luckily, Apple again re-releases our, our app. Crisis averted. This is like cramming for organic chemistry and realizing you can't cram for organic chemistry if anybody has done organic chemistry. Um, well, now we start acting like a big company. We actually do have an HR department. We have a PMO, complex sales organization, multiple levels of support. And finally, in March 2016, we released the third iteration of our product. And now, we're here. Really, when you graduate university, it's a time of relearning. Taking what you've learned in school and going, man, that is not all right. <laughs> and really a self-realization that maybe you ought to change the way you work. 2016 was a great year for TradeRev. As you've heard, great sales numbers. We have a US head office now. We're launched in the UK, 160 people. But that growth really causes strain on an organization. We have new departments, more management. Your high school friends are no longer there. <laughs> University friends are barely there. And really, these people can't grow with your organization. You make some really hard decisions. You've got to communicate better. And as the leaders, you have to learn to let go and trust your people. Concentrating on your core values is what you have to do. And it's about process and not projects now. It's the opposite of what most entrepreneurs want to do. We want to build stuff. But you have to almost slow down and go faster. So lots of questions. New verticals, anticipate change in your business, and new competitors. All great questions, more uncertainty. So what's the point here? <laughs> that raising a startup is filled with uncertainty. Every, every stage brings new challenges and it never gets easier. But you kind of have to embrace it. It is normal. Thanks. Questions? Hi, uh, uh, great presentation. Uh, Thank two you. questions. Uh, number one, how did you deal with the competition, the clone up uh, clones that came through? Number one. And number two, how did you personally change in terms of your workload in your personal life, daily lives? Uh, did you have a you know, better uh, thing or you know, it went for worse from a personal situation? Thanks. Um, I should ask my wife about the personal situation. Um, <laughs> I'll, I can answer the competition, it's, it's constant, and if you don't have any, you're doing something wrong. Um, it's just the nature of business. And so you have to, that's why I said you gotta stick to your core values and know what made you successful in the first place and keep executing on that strategy. Um, so they're me too's and they're always me too's and we innovate, and that's what we do best, so we always double down on our technology and our people. Last question. Cool. Thanks, everyone.